My name is Adam Pease, and I'm a principal scientist at Infosys. I'd like to talk about ontology for digital media, cognitive computing for both media and entertainment. As an overview, media rights today and the aspects of payment and controlling and cataloging media assets are very complex and very dynamic. Assets are proliferating rapidly and we believe that a new method is necessary for capturing those assets and the definitions, the metadata, the information about those assets. Uh, Infosys has adopted an expressive ontology, so we believe minimal effort is expended in cataloging new assets, new asset types, and new asset rights. Uh, there's a lot of work in industry uh, in metadata, metadata management and taxonomy uh, to try to capture the labels about information. Uh, your typical uh, information designer, database engineer, systems architect uh, will come up with uh, spreadsheets or databases and they'll have labels for information. And if there's a particularly formal metadata management process, uh, there'll be at least some sort of English comments, usually quite brief, uh, that ex are expected to capture uh, some level of definition for those labels. Uh, the problem is that isn't really enough. If your definitions uh, and your labels are just in human natural language, in English or some other language, uh, the machine will not really be able to do a lot to tell you that your metadata is consistent or right. Uh, we have an approach that will let the computer actually help us out. And the old way of doing things, of just having labels and comments, was fine uh, if you only had tens or maybe hundreds of fields. Uh, but nowadays that's not the case. We have tens of thousands of different fields uh, describing all sorts of information about our data. And we need the computer to be able to give us a little bit of help to make sure that that metadata is right. This also ties into business rules, the constraints uh, on the data, and the processes uh, that are followed whereby the data is managed. Uh, and of course this is complex. Uh, it takes effort. And so if you're just starting from scratch, it's never enough. Um, and that's why most people don't do this more sophisticated method because it just seems impossible or daunting. It has to accrete slowly over time. Uh, otherwise, it's an insurmountable problem. Well, we've spent the last 20 years doing exactly this, of coming up with a large library of exactly this sort of metadata with a focus on media uh, so that we can simply reuse a lot of information information that would otherwise have to be created from scratch that constitutes the definitions of the core concepts in this metadata. So data design unfortunately is often seen as something that any analyst can do as programmers, uh, those of us who are programmers or systems analysts, uh, have been doing this all for a very long time for most of our careers. From our first uh, few weeks as programmers, we were learning how to do data designs. And so it's easy to believe that the things that worked in the small and that worked for sort of conventional programming with small numbers of fields in the database as opposed to uh, small numbers of fields and large numbers of instances or rows, if you think in a, a, a table and column format, uh, those processes do start to break down as the data designs get larger. The results are stovepipes or silos of data that inevitably must get rewritten or mapped to new assets um, when the scope of a, a project changes. And the world moves too rapidly now. The scope of projects always change. Uh, there are always uh, desires to move in and have more different kinds of data, to have a larger scope of data, to uh, interoperate with other systems. Uh, and so uh, we adopt a standard software engineering method of reuse. Now it's uh, quite remarkable that although uh, the standard software engineering method of reuse is taken as a given nowadays, we don't write our programs from scratch without libraries like we did in the 1950s or 1960s. Nowadays, every programmer uh, has at his or her disposal uh, a vast library of reusable components, but those components are for, for procedures or 
things that are done, uh, their procedural programming. So if you write in Java, you have access to the whole JDK and then endless numbers of other uh, useful frameworks. If you write in Python, you've got the Python libraries. Uh, for information design, people still start uh, saying, you know, this is a table, this is a column, this column has a, a, a you know, numeric value or a string value or so forth. Um, and not a lot of information about the definition of what that data is supposed to mean. What is it supposed to represent? What is it for? Uh, so if you want to develop uh, data like we do in modern software development, we need some of the components uh, that are part of the modern software development process. Uh, first off, uh, a large reusable library, uh, but second also an expressive language. So uh, simple taxonomies are not enough. It's not enough just to have uh, labels and uh, great, uh, more specific, uh, more general relationship. That's all a taxonomy gives you. Uh, you can go to a little greater level of expressiveness if you have uh, graph knowledge bases. Uh, a lot of people are very excited about these sorts of things. Um, but still, just nodes and arcs uh, is actually not enough. Uh, we won't at this presentation go into uh, issues about logical representation, uh, but we'd be eager to follow up uh, and answer questions about that uh, in more detail in another time. So the reusable library is what makes the uh, coding process practical, whether you're doing procedural software development or we believe when you're doing uh, large-scale data design and uh, language processing tools that we also have that are associated uh, with this reusable library are part of what makes the process efficient. You know, things that are analogous to a modern integrated development environment to help you find the right things in the library and, and state them efficiently. So we offer a, a language for knowledge description that's more expressive than graphs or semantic web languages. It's actually a, called technically a higher order logic um, and it allows the machine to tell you, to give you proofs that your data, uh, your metadata is at, uh, consistent or it gives you proofs often of when you f it finds things that are inconsistent. It tells you what's wrong. And this is what's necessary when you've got you know, tens of thousands of fields and definitions associated with these fields. There's no way for any one human being uh, to know that every element of, say, a 10,000 field database is congruent with every other one of those 10,000 fields. Uh, you've got 10 to the thousand to the power of two combinations. Uh, that's well beyond human capacity. We need computers to be able to do that kind of cross-checking of definitions. Uh, so our library has about 20,000 concepts, all with handwritten definitions in logic. These are not uh, things that you can do automatically. Just like modern programming development, uh, if you uh, take data design as being analogous uh, to modern program development, then it's obvious we can't just uh, press a button and have a system write uh, an arbitrary uh, program for us, a program of arbitrary complexity uh, with respect to uh, some stated requirements. Uh, we're actually going to have to treat it like programming, write it by hand. Uh, and what makes it practical, again, is the reuse of a library, just like in modern programming. It's hard work, um, but we have a lot of tools that make this easier. Um, and the fact is, it's just at some level not avoidable. If you want to have a really integrated system, you want to do it quickly, uh, you want to have it be able to be checked by computer, um, this is the way to go. So we have tools that create this knowledge in the right format as an extension to the library, whole integrated development, uh, lots of associated natural language processing tools, and uh, things like knowledge extraction, sentiment analysis, relation extraction, uh, that we'll be talking about on other podcasts. All this is uh, based around a system called SUMO, the Suggested Upper Merged Ontology that's been around for about 20 years. Uh, we've developed uh, a wide variety of different domain ontologies. Um, so it's not just an industry-specific uh, ontology. Uh, that Those sorts of things do have value, uh, but the problem is, again, as the scope changes, if you want to go outside that narrow stovepipe, then you're forced to re-architect. And that's exactly what we need to avoid uh, in data design. So we have a comprehensive ontology that starts at a very general level and decomposes the world uh, in a wide variety of different domains. And as we've developed these different domains, we found that in fact this approach is very robust. 
We haven't seen the need uh, to revise the definitions of things at the upper, upper level because they were carefully crafted and debugged by a large number of people over several decades now. Uh, we've linked all these uh, ontologies to uh, a large set of lexicons, so we have a, lar a really strong basis for internationalization. We have about 25 different languages uh, in this suite. All of these linkages, again, were done by hand. It's something that seems very painful uh, and is not sort of popular these days, but it's exactly this hard work that gets you a product with a very long life and a, a very broad set of uh, use cases in which it's applicable. I've already mentioned the integrated development environment, lots of tools, uh, and also tools in general for natural language processing. So a lot of these tools are discussed uh, in a book that I wrote a number of years ago. I uh, encourage you to get a copy uh, if you feel so inclined. Uh, there's also lots of additional associated information on online, uh, and we'd love to talk, to talk with you about this more. So thanks very much for listening.